Notice that sometimes when one stands behind the podium and one is not very tall, one can look like part of the podium. <laughs> so good morning. Thank you for having me here. Uh, my name is Jonathan Fite. I'm co-founder and chief executive of Beyond Lucid Technologies. And uh, if Chris Montera were here in the room right now, we would be competing for biggest geek on site. Uh, but since apparently he's not, um, hopefully I'm bar none. And I am going to geek out on you a little bit, and I'm going to try to uh, hopefully keep you awake as well. So. <laughs> With that, um, just real briefly, for those of you who have not heard of Beyond Lucid Technologies, we are a, uh, a pre-hospital documentation company and pre-hospital health information exchange. Uh, I'm not going to talk too much about us specifically, but I'm happy to explain what all of that means uh, later on if you'd like. But what I am going to do is talk to you a bit about sort of the nuts and bolts of, what, uh, of how data falls into the conversation about community paramedicine. Um, and particularly, as you can see, underlined and bolded here, and if I had flashing lights I'd put around it, is the discussion of proof. Uh, and I heard earlier in, a, in an earlier conversation today, folks still talking about the, the relative value of these programs and how to get paid for them and so on. A and ultimately, it does come down to proof. Um, and at the end of the day, that means information. That means data. That means statistics and so on and so forth. <laughs> um, so with that, hopefully this thing works. There we go. So. <laughs> Um, as we see it, uh, it, it, the hallmarks of community paramedicine programs across the country and indeed across the world really seem to fall into three main buckets, if you will. Um, and for all their different flavors and all their different designs, at the end of the day, they start with improving patient care by caring for patients over time. Uh, whether that's 30 days, 60 days, 180 days, five days, uh, the idea that you need to know this patient, see this patient more than once, whether because they're calling you, um, because they're calling 911 or your respective emergency service, or because they're coming back to the ED, one way or another you're going to encounter these folks more than once. Uh, the second comes down to the question of how you get paid and how much it costs to operate uh, this service, and that's the, the goal of reducing costs. Uh, for those of you from the U.S., and I apologize if I get this, if this is not applicable beyond, but the conversation of the triple aim uh, focuses on improving care, improving access to care, and lowering cost. And so, uh, although I am, I am not a clinician, uh, I am a technologist and a business person, uh, I cannot help with number one per se, but as an MBA, presumably I can have something to say about the second, and certainly when you run a small business, you get really good at, co at controlling costs. Um, and. Uh, the third is centralizing the role of EMS in a connected healthcare ecosystem. Um, and this is really what I want to focus on today. It's the connected part. Um, because there's a lot of talk, and my company is based out in the Silicon Valley area, so there's even more talk there about things like wearables and, uh, and, and the Internet of Things and Internet of Everything and, and some very big names playing in this space so they don't really know what to do with it. Um, so the idea that... <laughs> Uh, one of the things that we have always found so interesting about EMS and, and fire and related services is that as ubiquitous as these services are everywhere in the world, they are also one of the least understood yet most obvious parts of our municipal infrastructure, whether you're private or public or, or hospital affiliated, right? You're there in plain sight, often with really loud things and flashing lights attached to your vehicles, yet so few people have any idea what it is you do. And so the idea that uh, this focus, uh, my focus today, will be on connecting those dots with the rest of the ecosystem that you in many ways empower. And I'm gonna quote a gentleman named Bob Kocher now, who's a, known now as a venture capitalist out in, in California at a firm called Venrock. Uh, but he was previously known uh, as one of the architects, uh, keep your politics aside, but one of the architects of the Affordable Care Act. Um, and he mentioned to me at one point in a conversation when I was asking him why so few, so few people know and understand and appreciate EMS that he doesn't understand why EMS is as disrespected as it is because they bring in the revenue. Right? I mean, think about how many patients go to healthcare systems on vehicles with wheels, right? So the, the idea that EMS is already doing this, yet so few people understand what you do. So that's really the part I want to talk about today. And to make sure you're awake, I'm going to start with a little survey here. First of all, again, from a data and technology side, how many of you, uh, show of hands if you like the technology that you're using today, particularly your EPCR? How many of you don't? How many of you don't use anything? And so are using, particularly for your, EP, your uh, community paramedicine program, but possibly for whatever your primary services, how many of you are still using paper to track your patients? 
really thick books, and then you have to hold on to those for a really long time, and paper and ink is expensive. Okay, so first question. Second question, how many of you see the value in technology, data, science, information, and so on? And how many of you aren't really sure why it is I'm standing up here talking to you right now? <laughs> All right, and uh, at least I'm glad I didn't get a lot of those hands, but maybe when we get to the end, I should ask that question again. And the third, how many of you have figured out how to get paid for this community prayer medicine work you're doing? Of course you have, Mike. <laughs> how, how many have not and are still trying to figure that out? How many of you have stopped trying? then you should not look at the U.S. workforce report today. Because there are a lot of people who apparently stopped trying to find work there too. Um, so this is really going to be my goal today, is to help you understand how the translation of information uh, translates to getting paid. And so here's your first pop culture reference, uh, which is the, how many of you have seen Training Day? How many of you expected to see a Training Day slide in a community paramedicine program? All right, it's not what you know, it's what you can prove. And again, this is really one of the, probably the biggest challenge, at least in this Data Geek's opinion, <laughs> about <laughs> going out and asking folks to pay for your work. Um, because there is the persistent challenge, and some of it is academic, and some of it is clinical, and again, I'm not a clinician, but I did go to a pretty geeky business school in Carnegie Mellon. We sort of swim around in numbers. And so one of the things that I find so interesting about EMS, again, when you compare, and I have, I have partners on the electronic health record side of the industry that work and specialize in small businesses, so small practices. And oftentimes, they struggle to get to statistical significance because their practices are small or rural or uh, however they need to market themselves. One of the things that's so fascinating about emergency medical services and medical transportation in general is the volume of patients that you see. One of the, uh, or the uh, sites where my company is serving a community paramedicine program is in Alameda County, California. Uh, Alameda, uh, for those of you who don't know, is probably about the size of Saskatoon. In fact, Saskatoon may be bigger than, uh, than Alameda County, uh, Alameda, city of Alameda at least. Um, Alameda County is really big. It's got Oakland in it and a bunch of other uh, very large cities. But what's interesting about this is that in the city of Alameda, which has one of California's uh, 12 community paramedicine programs, they have three different groups of frequent users, uh, familiar faces as they call them. Uh, there are the frequent users, there are the super users, and there are the mega users which is two people in the city of Alameda who have called EMS for transport more than 300 times in a year. So that's a sample size of one who is actually statistically significant on their own. Uh, actually, sample size of two. But each of them individually is statistically significant. So the idea that we need to talk about the, the data generated by the transport of these people. Why are they calling? What can we do about it? And there is enough information out there if only you had the systems to crunch those numbers down to give you a lot of information about how to regionalize your service and indeed how to get paid for it if you start to squeeze the value out of that data. So the next question is your second pop culture reference, actually second and third pop culture reference. How many of you have read the book Freakonomics? How many of you have watched the show House? Oh God, I hope more hands. Right, okay, there you go. So the idea that uh, certainly in, in house they say people lie. I'm gonna uh, paraphrase the book Freakonomics and say that data tends to lie. And the reason is because people are, tend to be really bad at seeing the trends. Um, we tend to make a lot of assumptions about the things that we see. And certainly this is one of the big conversations that is going on around community paramedicine. Indeed, in my own backyard in California, um, it was the most remarkable thing to go to the hearing about community paramedicine and the justification for why community paramedicine should be allowed in California. And the, the California Nurses Association representative got up in front of an administrative judge and said, and I'm paraphrasing, but pretty close to accurate, um, the reason that EMS should not be allowed to engage in community paramedicine is because they've never been trained to do it. So train them. I mean, it wasn't a rocket science concept, right? But this idea that we have inertia in our brains and we like to look at things and say, based on the trends that we see, this is the conclusion that we can draw. And to some degree that says we need to have oodles and mountains of proof in order to make any decisions. At the same time, we do. It's called people who get transported 300 times a year. So we have enough information there that we can pull out. But the question is, can we turn that into a story that is statistically significant? And here's your third pop culture reference. So uh, uh, a few good men. Really? I mean, Aaron Sorkin movie? I just, okay. So, 
the, the question of if, if you found that the truth is what you wanted or didn't want it, how would it accommodate your program design? And so <laughs> this gets me into the conversation of the role that technology plays. And so as we see it, as, as I see, and again, my bias being that I run a technology company, but I don't think you need to, in order to understand that what you're all doing on pieces of paper is what we're talking about doing with technology. At the end of the day, it's the same goal. The first is to capture patient information in the field. Right? That could be, or as I heard earlier this morning, it could be having your patients come to you because you're running a rural clinic and your patients are coming to you. Uh, that was WACA, right? I believe in the, in the back, right? <laughs> so we're <laughs> where folks are coming in and, and you're taking care of them, but you're essentially working at all hours of day or night wherever they are. Um, I used to work in the media industry, and that's something they were aspiring to, being everywhere you are at all times, and you all are doing that now. So congratulations, you should teach the media something. So capturing information is one thing. Then you need to be able to hand that information off to somebody else who's going to care about it. In the case of a 911 transport, that might be handing them off to a hospital emergency department. If you're using a piece of scratch paper or something, or, or a, a, you know, a, a Sharpie and a and a glove, uh, that can be particularly more challenging. Forget the HIPAA violation, it's just a, a lot of information to convey when it's on the back of your glove. But in this case, you face the additional problem of seeing these patients over and over and over again. And then there's this epic Cerner, Meditech, electronic health record system that is just dying to take the data that you can give it. Too bad you don't have any way of giving that to them. We're gonna get to that. But the third <laughs> is, the ability to track those patients over time, look them up, understand who they are, because the way that we have designed uh, pre-hospital technology to date, and I think this goes uh, across our industry, at least in the United States, is on an incident-specific basis. At the end of the day, an EPCR, whatever you want to call it, is an incident report. It's a record. It's what I saw. It's the five W's in journalism. Who, what, where, when, why, and what am I doing with you next? basically, who's gonna care about this? And as you start to transition to the fact that you're gonna see these patients more and more, now you're just gonna end up with books, right? For those of you who are using paper to do this, how much paper, how much square footage in your office would you say those records take up right now? Uh, and the diligence associated with writing down everything that you encountered takes an enormous amount of work, even more than doing your standard documentation. Then the next part of this conversation, which comes down to the moving of information, again, is that I, I fly Delta all the time. I use the Delta app on my phone, and if my flight is delayed or boarding or whatever, I get a notification that I can get there. We have been asking across this industry, I've only been it for about seven years now, and I've heard more times than I can count, why don't we have a heads up awareness as to where you are on the way to the hospital? Why is it that I've sat in the control center at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center and watched a, uh, uh, the, the medical director who was on call at that particular time assess an incoming STEMI over the phone? I mean, there is so much more information, and they're great, by the way, but that is a, a world-class standard and still what they're working with. So the idea that there is so much more that we can do, why aren't we leveraging that in this industry? And so this gets to the, I should have gone to this slide a couple seconds ago, but nevertheless, the question about what's the difference between incident-specific data and patient-specific data, right? And so the, what, what changes in the way that you have to ask questions, interview your patients, track information, share information. When you start not looking at these patients as folks you're going to see today, but maybe not tomorrow, as instead you're gonna see these folks tomorrow and next week and the following and so on and so forth. And as someone who served in the United States Army Reserve, I take this a bit personally because the US DOD and Veterans Administration have the largest unified data set in the world. And in the belly of the beast in San Francisco, where so much silly technology comes out of, if, an, if a, a, a veteran, a homeless veteran, seizes on the street and is picked up by EMS today and is transported to the hospital, stabilized and released, and seizes again 48 hours later on the street, there is no way in San Francisco for that patient's record to be tracked over a 48-hour period unless it happens to be the same crew showing up on site and remembering that person and who they are. Our data systems do not connect, but they can, and they should. And there is so much infighting about who's gonna run that that is not going anywhere, even in the belly of the technology beast. So the key to success, as I hypothesize and purported in this industry, as we move from incident incident-specific documentation and encountering to patient-specific is to understand the role of information and understand what it means to share data. Uh, this is a, a screenshot of a white paper that I'd be happy to share with you. I have some copies in the back uh, that uh, EMS World published. 
of mine about a year ago. It's called the five R's of community paramedicine and mobile integrated health, which I realize may not apply to everybody here. I was told not to use mobile integrated health, but in ca back in the, in the US, we are having literally whole conference sessions around whether to call this thing community paramedicine or mobile integrated health instead of caring for people over time. Um, but the idea that there is inform that there's information that needs to be captured here, and yet there is so much inertia and so much distrust of technology. I mean, the idea that uh, EMS agencies across the United States do not want to talk about EPCR. I have found this remarkable, by the way, because I, I sell an EPCR. I also sell community paramedicine technology. They're the same thing. The way that they function is a little bit differently, but it's been remarkable to be able to have a conversation about community paramedicine technology with folks who don't want to talk about EPCR when it's literally the same tech, but the name is different. And we need to start understanding the fact that we need to focus on the outcome and not what it's called in order to be able to get the value out of that. So with that, how many of you show of hands have heard the phrase HL7, have published an RFP that asked for HL7? Show of hands, how many people actually know what HL7 is, does, what it actually stands for? I think we've got five hands. Uh, first of all, HL7, so what is this HL7 thing anyway? It's an international standard that stands for Health Level 7. I, by the way, have spent, I've been in this game seven years, I've spent like eight trying to understand what Health Level 6 was, and I'm a little afraid to know where Health Level 8 is going to be, but that's a conversation for another time. <laughs> And, and what I really want to raise to you, and you should take this home and do some investigation, and I'm happy to send you a number of resources published by the Office of the National Coordinator of Health IT in the US and Health Level 7 itself and so on about what it is and how it connects and what, it, what, it, what role it plays in transitions of care like community paramedicine. Uh, the second question is, uh, show of hands, how many of you have heard of Nemesis 3? And I realize this is probably more relevant to the US, but uh, for those of you who've not heard of it, thank you for those who raised your hand, <laughs> the Nemesis 3 is a national EMS information system. This is essentially HL7 for EMS. It's the data backbone of our system. Uh, and one of the reasons, because EMS in the United States has its own data backbone. It is very problematic when RFPs come out, for example, asking for EPCR that is HL7 compliant because that actually cannot exist. Uh, it does not exist, it cannot exist. It's like saying that you want a computer that is also a piece of paper. I suppose sometime people could do that at some point, but it would still be one or the other. Uh, there are, however, ways to make them in talk to one another, and that's what we're going to get into in a second. So I want you to, to, to think about these two questions. Why is HL7 relevant? Why are people asking for it? And, and how do we and why do we need to get on to this new data standard, Nemesis 3, which, by the way, I should have also mentioned, is, is far more rigid than Nemesis 2, its precursor. And Canada has its own standard, but it's comparable to Nemesis. Um, I'm not exactly sure what Australia has. I know that Europe has another standard that is also comparable to Nemesis. And, and the rigidity and the standard base, someone previously to this, actually the speaker right before us talking about standards, the more common we make this information, the less floppy and, infl and flexible we make this information, the better it is to share information. The challenge is, that you have to agree on what you're going to capture. And you have to understand from a statistical perspective what the importance is of that. So it, when, again, when folks ask for an HL7 standard, um, they are an, unfortunately revealing some lack of understanding of what HL7 is. Because if I told you that we were having this, converse, this, this conference in a building, you would probably not know where to go. Right? You would say that a hotel is a building, but so is a home and so is an office, and so is your station, right? So HL7 is a structure, it's the backbone of the building. What you need to, to be able to speak to is what do you want that building to do and to be? And the importance of HL7, just like the importance of Nemesis, is to provide a structure. But every type of HL7-based document, which are in this case known by a broad category of CDA, which is Clinical Documentation Architecture, um, is a US federally recognized set of documents and set of standards underlying them that allow, <laughs> thank you, that allow for the information to be wrapped up in a manner 
that can be used. I won't, for time's sake, I won't go into all of them, but I will mention that CCD, for example, stands for the Clinical uh, Continuity of Care Document. That's the version that my company uses to export data from an ePCR. CCDA stands for C Consolidated Clinical Document Architecture. It does different things. The CDAR2 is the version of, for interoperability that Nemesis published a, a method to accomplish. So to the degree that your ePCR system should be sharing data, there are several different methods that they can do. And it would behoove you all to understand the role of that as you start to talk about sharing information with your hospital system. Because the ability to have that information shared and tracked and monitored and sent back to you with outcomes data and so on and so forth depends upon your ability to share that information in bi-directional fashion, but certainly on the way in because in the hospital, they're not using the back of their glove. You're using the back of your glove and a piece of paper or a triplicate that you're going to go back and retype at your station. So in order to ensure that the information you're capturing is feasibly sent into the care facility, you need to understand what you're asking them to do. <laughs> and the La uh, yeah, I'm going to try to speed through some of this. But once you have a Nemesis 3 structure, you're on the way. By my estimate, you're about 85% of the way there to, toward that continuity of care document or the CDA that you need to share information with an electronic health record system. Yes, even Epic, that conversation comes up more than I would like. But Epic can readily consume CDA documents. So as long as you have some form of, uh, of genuine and, and valid CDA, you can send that data into Epic. But you still need to supplement that data. Why? Because EMS has historically been a incident specific documentation, uh, uh, incident specific practice, right? And our documentation is in incident specific. And as we move toward patient specific information that carries over time, we need to recognize that there are parts of that CDA because that's the standard that's used to communicate between clinics and hospitals and uh, dialysis facilities and nursing homes, but not EMS. We have our own information system. It ultimately gets down to the fact that we are regulated as a transportation system, as a, uh, in, at least in the US under DOT, as opposed to uh, under Health and Human Services as an electronic health record system. So the missing parts of the CDA that are not in Nemesis essentially fall into the buckets that you see here. Family history, past encounters, mental health, and other social factors, access to food, access to transportation, access to medication, somebody you can talk to if you need to go to rehab or you need to go to some type of intervention program. Can you even get there? Those data are captured in the clinical record, but they're not historically captured by EMS because we didn't need them. You didn't see these patients enough. Right? So the, uh, and, and even if you did, it was still record after record after record. But once you start stringing them together, the fact that my father, if my father is a diabetic trans... ...ability to have your crew on site know who he is for sure is interesting and relevant. To have the hospital he may go to is exciting. But who I really might want to know who I really want to be connected is my mother, right? Because my mother has his health story. My mother is the one who knows that he's been seen multiple times. That information, those disconnects are persistent in our industry. And to the degree that you can funnel all that information together into one master record, you have the ability to provide the context that you need to care for these patients over time. That information is available, but it needs to be added to the EMS record. And once you add it to a structured Nemesis record and you know, send it out in a way that is uh, consumable by an electronic health record system, you have the ability to have context and make informed decisions, track trends on a patient-specific basis, not just an agency-specific basis. Imagine the ability on the fly at the patient's side to be able to see how their heart rate or blood pressure or medication adherence have been doing over the past month in real time at their side. That's what electronic health record systems do today. EMS record systems can do as well if they are appropriately structured that way. And of course, at the same time, having all that information reduces the, uh, the risk that anything would be missed and enables you to, uh, to perform as you, uh, to, to essentially to demonstrate the value in terms of better care, lower cost, lower workload, 
and more efficient conversation with the rest of that ecosystem, enabling you to pull out the types of results that I'm actually pleased to publish to you for the first time today coming out of Alameda County, which is a 75% reduction in returns to the ED within a 30-day period over a year, and 51 and 3 quarters percent reduction in frequent use of EMS, because they knew who these patients were. They could be proactive. They could stand at their side and say, I know what happened to you last week, and I know who I need to contact to keep you from coming back, and I know who your next of kin is that is authorized to have your health care information right now, and, and your caregivers who are beyond the EMS system or even the health system, but maybe Alcoholics Anonymous. And I know that you don't have access to food because you ha don't have a license to be able to get your benefits. So now I know what I need to do. And when you look at the data system as more than a necessary evil, we can start to, 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 cr to create something much more useful out of it and share that with the rest of the ecosystem that you are already empowering. And we're just pleased to help. Thank you very much.